Today, the world's shores are under attack. Armies of aliens are secretly invading our coasts. In the Caspian Sea, swarms of ghostly hunters have contributed to the collapse of entire commercial fisheries. In Europe, armoured invaders are rampaging up rivers and threatening local fish stocks. The largest wetland in the world, the Pantanal, is being infiltrated by a silent killer that could destroy this fragile ecosystem. And throughout the world's oceans, huge blooms of toxic algae are contaminating shellfish, causing thousands of deaths. One of the big problems with biological invasions, of course, is that once they established, once the species has invaded, there's virtually nothing you can do about it. One phenomenon is a major cause of this catastrophe. And according to experts, it's threatening the whole marine environment. This is the story of these invasions, why they're happening, and the steps being taken to prevent them. The oceans cover over two-thirds of the world's surface. These waters are the largest habitat on Earth. And from the remotest depths to the seashore, they contain a dazzling variety of life. But the greatest number of marine creatures live in coastal waters. Because here, where sunlight penetrates to the seabed, food and nutrients can be found in abundance. Most of these creatures stay put. Their dispersal discouraged by natural barriers such as land and by changes in water temperature and salinity. So unique coastal ecosystems have formed where a balance has been established over millions of years. But today, that balance is being drastically changed. And here's the reason why, shipping. This is the Don Quixote, transoceanic car carrier. She's just left Baltimore and is bound for Zeebrugge in Belgium to load a new consignment of cars. Inside her ballast tanks, she's carrying thousands of tons of seawater drawn from North American harbors. But also inside these tanks are millions of tiny stowaways, all hitching a lift. It's a menagerie of microscopic life forms, mostly invisible to the naked eye. None of these would normally be making this journey. Here at Zeebrugge, as cars are loaded, this water and its stowaways are discharged into a totally foreign environment. And that's when the trouble begins. All ships must carry ballast to keep them steady and level in the water. At any one time, up to five billion tons of ballast water is being carried around the world, transferring over 10,000 different species of marine microbes, plants and animals to distant shores, and with devastating consequences. In Iran, the shores of the Caspian Sea attract hordes of holidaymakers. 
boosting the local economy. But there's another visitor to the Caspian that's a lot less welcome. Fishermen on these shores have been the main victims of this alien presence. Fishermen like Hassan Yusuf Inijad. He made a good living from these waters for over 30 years. He and his crew catch a local fish called kilka at night, using lights to attract them into the nets. Fishing here was very good until 1999. We were fishing with 10 to 12 crew members on each boat. And we would catch between 300 kilos and 400 kilos each. We were happy and content with our lives until this unwelcome creature came to the Caspian Sea. This is the creature responsible for Hassan's problems. It's the comb jellyfish. And although it doesn't look too threatening, the locals call it the monster. Its natural habitat is thousands of miles away, in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean off North America. There, its numbers are naturally controlled by other carnivorous jellyfish. But international shipping unintentionally gave the comb jelly a free ride to areas where it has no natural predators. During the 1980s, it showed up in the Black Sea and a few years later in the Caspian Sea. In these waters, already stressed by overfishing and pollution, the population of this alien invader exploded. I think this jellyfish is going to destroy all the kilka. And not just the stock, it will destroy us. Because our lives are dependent on this fish. We can no longer provide even the bare necessities and our lives are getting worse each day. We are facing poverty, debt. We can't pay the crews, nor even provide for our families. I can't do anything about this creature. I'm totally helpless. All along the Caspian Sea coastline, Fishing is one of the main industries. With the fish fast disappearing, the lives of thousands of people have been affected. Specially built fish meal factories have been abandoned. The shipyards, which maintain the Caspian fishing industry, are falling into disrepair. And the Iranian fishing fleet is slowly disintegrating. <laughs> Stories like these are unfolding all over the world and they are not confined to the people and animals living by the coast. Belem Novo is a small village on the edge of Lake Guayba. This too used to be a thriving fishing community. 
Now nobody bothers to go fishing at all. Except one man, Senor Ney. And he only continues to check his nets from force of habit. Two years ago, I used to catch 500 kilo, 1,000 kilo of fish. I used to sell it. Today, I don't even have fish to eat at home. The cause of the problem is another tiny creature that again seems almost insignificant. This is the golden mussel. The fish eat it, but I think it's harming them, because they've all gone. This is what it does in the water. One mussel has clustered here, and others are growing around it. Now they are growing over themselves, forming a bowl. See, the net is empty. If we had to eat from it, we would be hungry. All we've got is mussels. The golden mussel's natural home is in the rivers of China and Southeast Asia. In the early 90s, it was carried in ship's ballast water to the estuary of the Rio Plata in Argentina. Here, with no predators to keep it in check, this freshwater mussel thrived. Just as it got this far in ballast water, so ships continued to carry it further inland. Attached to the hulls of vessels, it travelled thousands of kilometres upriver into Brazil. After only five years of invasion, the mussel reached Porto Alegre. This is a busy port with ships passing to and fro around the continent. Now the banks of the rivers are littered with millions of foul-smelling, razor-sharp mussel shells. And it's these, covering the riverbed, that are causing untold damage. This water supply station has recently seen its maintenance costs triple. Two years ago, servicing took place twice a year. Now this pump has to be lifted every month. Because over 700,000 mussels are packed into every square meter of its surface. The impact of this tiny pest grows ever wider. As it moves further and further inland, it's affecting the very infrastructure of the country. This is one of the biggest hydroelectric dams in Brazil, supplying 10% of the energy generated in the whole country. In 2002, the mussel was discovered for the first time in its reservoir. Not long after, it was spotted by maintenance workers overhauling the system. When the mussels start colonizing the pipes of the cooling system, the quantity of water used to cool everything down is reduced, and the machine begins overheating. So, to preserve itself, and to preserve the system as a whole, the machine switches itself off. So, imagine if we have a catastrophe, and all the machines decide to come off the system because of a problem like that. The lack of energy could cause a blackout in the whole of Brazil. A 
and around the world, human health is also being affected by the onslaught of these invasions. Just off the coast of South Africa, what looks like a huge red stain on the surface of the water is actually a mass of living organisms. This is a red tide, a bloom of tiny microscopic algae called dinoflagellates. This phenomenon occurs naturally when changing currents disrupt the nutrient cycle of coastal waters. But such plankton blooms can be disastrous for the marine environment. These dinoflagellates often find their way into ships' ballast tanks and are transported around the world. This is really bad news, because some red tides can be lethal to humans. This tiny organism produces a most deadly toxin. It causes mass die-offs of some marine creatures by attacking their nervous system. But shellfish, such as clams and mussels, remain unharmed. The poison accumulates in their bodies, but outwardly they appear normal. The deadly alien invaders have destroyed fishing industries, threatened power supplies, and put people at death's door. Now, as world trade grows and shipping booms, more and more ballast water is being transported. But shipping also brings tremendous benefits to modern society. Transporting 90% of world trade it provides a service on which the global economy and its future depends. But there is hope. Action is being taken. And it starts here in London, at the offices of the International Maritime Organization. IMO is an agency of the United Nations, and part of its responsibility is the protection of the marine environment from shipping activities. IMO has taken a number of initiatives, uh, together with its member states, the shipping industry, as well as non-governmental organizations. That's led to the development of a set of guidelines, as well as, more recently, to the adoption of the International Convention on Ballast Water Management. The aim is for all shipping to abide by these regulations by the year 2016. Among this measure will be a ballast water exchange at mid-ocean, or measure with a view to remove, kill, or reduce the effect or impact of harmful organism carried by ballast water. For these regulations to work, IMO wanted as many countries as possible to sign up. And to encourage developing countries, the Global Ballast Water Management Project was set up in cooperation with the Global Environment Facility and the United Nations Development Programme. Under the rules of the Convention, all ships must now exchange their ballast water out at sea. But not everyone's convinced that ballast water exchange at sea is the answer. In rough uh, weather conditions, a ship's captain may be quite reluctant to undertake uh, ballast water exchange because it may actually threaten the stability and the structural integrity of the ship. So in those sorts of situations, it's probably not a safe thing to do. So this practice of ballast water exchange is very much an interim measure. And what is very important that while this is available as a management tool now, we also need to work to find new and improved ballast water treatment methods to provide a more effective and more complete uh, solution to, to the transfer of these species. Several companies were already developing methods to kill off the organisms inside the tanks. And the ideas they were coming up with had their inspiration in some unexpected places. 
my boss called this meeting in Los Angeles to see if we could come up with some solutions to treat the ballast water. We'd had this tremendously frustrating meeting. We didn't come up with any solutions. And later, we were sitting in a hot tub, much like this one here, when my boss turned to me and he said, I hate the smell of chlorine in the water. And I'm thinking of um, using ozone in my hot tub at home. It was at that moment he had this eureka moment. It was like a light bulb went off on his head. And he said, well, why don't we use ozone to treat ballast water? He immediately jumped out of the hot tub. He went upstairs, got online and started a search to look for a company that could help us. He found a company that he thought might be promising and he called them up and he explained what he wanted. After a burst of lightning, you get that smell and that is ozone. Ozone is a very effective disinfectant that has been used in drinking water systems for a long time. What we like about it is that there are no dangerous chemicals that we have to put in the ballast water. It dissipates in a few seconds back to its natural elements and that there are no harmful chemicals that will be left that could have an effect on the environment. So now that ozone works and is very effective, however, we had to work on the equipment to shrink it and make it more efficient. We have since designed the Mark II version, which we are about to install in one of our tankers, and we hope to have a fully functioning and operating ozone generator system in about a year's time. Meanwhile, a company in Europe had already been testing a different ballast water treatment system under real-life marine conditions. And it was installed on the Don Quixote. We wanted to use a technology that would rid the ballast tanks from invasive species without causing any harm to the environment. So we looked at the, the natural processes that occurs when, when UV light hits the seawater. When microorganisms at the surface are exposed to the sun-strong ultraviolet rays, a reaction takes place that destroys them. It consists of two cylinders, each containing about 20 ultraviolet lamps. Together with a catalyst, the ultraviolet light from these lamps creates highly aggressive free radicals. After two years of testing, the company believes they've found a practical, effective treatment which doesn't compromise the environment. While promising, these systems may only work for certain types of ship. And this led one company to look for an entirely different solution. This tanker is one of a class of vessels known simply as VLCCs, or Very Large Crude Carriers. Here to be a standard tanker, but it isn't. This vessel is fitted with the prototype of a new system that could revolutionize the way that ships of this size manage their ballast. Tom Allen of the tanker company Vila explains why such a system is necessary. For us in the tanker industry, ballast water exchange is a big problem. If we had to stop at sea and change ballast water out, continually as the voyage progressed, it would cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. The reason for that is the size of these ships. They transport approximately 300,000 tons of crude oil on each voyage, which means on the ballast voyage, they carry 100,000 tons of ballast water. Tom Allen is part of a team that's developing a unique approach that might just eliminate the need for mid-ocean exchange and treatment methods. You know, simple ideas are usually the best ones, and that's what's unique about this system. There are no moving parts. The only thing we need to worry about are these pipeline connections. It's very simple. The hope is that the system could be fitted simply to most existing tankers. 
called the flow-through system, it takes advantage of a unique aspect of oil tanker design. As with all oil tankers today, this ship is equipped with a double hull. That means there's a void space between, this, between the side shell plates that we're looking at and the inner cargo space. That void space is used to carry ballast water. That's the problem, and that's why the flow-through system works, because it's easy for the ballast water to flow through using the motion of the ship and exit from the side of the ship. On the drawing board, this is how it'll work. Ballast water on double-hulled oil tankers is carried along the sides and bottom of the ship. If a hole is cut in the bows, the idea is that the forward motion of the ship will constantly push new ballast water into the ballast tanks, flushing out the old over the sides. Any marine creatures taken on board in harbour would be flushed out within a matter of hours. But cutting a hole in the bows of an oil tanker is a big step. Before they do this, the team want to test the system using the ship's ballast pumps alone. So far, tests show that some sort of flow-through system might be a viable means of exchanging ballast water. And because of the size of these ships, it could lead to a large percentage of the world's ballast water being managed more effectively. Different ships require different solutions. And these are just a few of the ones being looked at. And there's no time to lose. In South America, the golden mussel is continuing to spread north at a speed of 240 kilometers a year. Left unchecked, it could reach the Amazon basin by the year 2008. The population of cone jellies in the Caspian Sea has risen by over 5,000%. They're now threatening the lucrative caviar industry. Progress is being made, but its momentum must be maintained so that shipping can work in harmony with the environment.